you got to be kidding me. There's going to be this many people? Oh, my gosh, that's going to be a lot of people, and they're not even done setting up yet. they got this side of the house to go. There's going to be a lot of people here. Wow. Hi, since I'm here, you probably know my name's Seamus. We're going to be about 30 minutes. I'm going to talk 15 minutes, take a break. We've got another 15 minutes. I'm going to talk to you, and I'm talking to you at home. Hope you like this lecture, and we're going to work our way to a definition of my lecture called Circles in the City. So this can be pretty interesting. I'm going to have like a dual lecture with live people here and uh, the people at home watching what's on the screen. So as I start with every video, I say one thing, I, you know what it is. <laughs> Let's do this. Springfield, Illinois. Population 117,500 and growing. This is a map overview of Springfield, Illinois. I want to share it with you and what I think of this city. But to understand my viewpoint, I'm going to show you the size of the city and some facts that led up to how this place even became into existence. Well, here's the same map, but it gives you an idea of how much city there is versus greenery in the area that is known as Springfield, Illinois. Let me add a compass up here for you so you know which way is north, south, and east and west. As I go through some of these slides, you'll have an idea of where I'm talking about. So to measure this city, let's find a place that's the furthest northern border area of the city. How about the entrance to our airport, which is on the northern border of the city? And then we'll take the place along the southern border of the city, and that's our University of Illinois, Springfield, and it's down as we leave on the highway we know as I-55, there's an exit road uh, to get there. So if I draw a line between the farther north border area and the southern border area, what we get is an 8.2 mile line. So that's how far the city is from top to bottom. What about the other way? So let's draw a line from the east to the west. There we go, and that line, if we would measure that, is about nine and a half miles long. So now you have a concept that one way is 8.2 miles long and the other way is 9.5 miles long. It's been like this since the history and beginning of the city. The borders really have not changed. That's an important fact as we go forward. This city, and here it is again on the showing the city versus the greenery, was not always called Springfield, Illinois. It was actually called the city of Calhoun after Senator Calhoun, who did a lot of hunting and trapping in the area. That's the people who found the area and they called it Calhoun because they would hunt and fish here. They got here from the waterways. The Sangamon River came right through here and it was easy to get their canoes to an area where they could hunt. So this actually originally the area was called the city of Calhoun. So this is John Calhoun, Senator. John Calhoun, who stuck with his political career over and over till, yes, eventually he became the seventh vice president of the United States. So the state of Illinois as a whole didn't become a state till the year 1818. And the town Springfield, Illinois, which is presently the capital, and it's the third capital, it wasn't the first, wasn't even invented yet when the state became a state. Actually, a lot of the counties, like Sangamon County, wasn't here. This map shows what was around when the state became a state in 1818. And one of them was not Springfield, Illinois. We weren't here yet. The first known even structure in the area that we now know of as Springfield was about right about here on what we now know of as Second and Jefferson. It was built there by a guy named John Kelly. He came here with his wife and five children and a brother, I believe his name was Elijah, came here. They lived right there in a cabin. That was the first known structure in 1820. That's two years after the state even became a state. And there was nothing here but that log cabin. This is second in Jefferson now. There's no log cabins, no trees. It's part of the city's main thoroughfare now. It's such a main thoroughfare that the road is actually called a route Route 97 that goes from one side of town to the other side of town. It is that way because it is the first road of Springfield, Illinois. It's where the cabin was and where people came into town and left town, and it's still there today. So let's take a look at some chronological order of how Illinois and Springfield came to be. So in 1818, Illinois became a state. 
1820, that actual first structure, the cabin, built by John Kelly. In 1828, the 62% tax tariff was imposed on the South, and we'll get into that. In 1832, the residents here forced a name change from the city of Calhoun to Springfield. Let's talk about that. So yeah, the city residents changed their name from Calhoun because it was named after Senator Calhoun at the time. So why did they change it? First of all, he stepped down from being the vice president. He became a senator again for the state of South Carolina. He was against that tariff of 1828, and he was for plantation slavery. And he was against the ideals of the North and the industrial building of this country. And that's why they said, we don't associate with that guy anymore. We're in Illinois. We're changing our name. So let's get back to this chronological history. So in 1832, when Springfield changed her name away from Senator Calhoun's name, because he was associated with slavery and some other Southern ideals, uh, that was just a seed that got planted. Because later on in 1848, the Illinois Constitution actually banned slavery. And some time went by, and then in 1853, a law was passed called the Black Code, and it was voted in. And there are books written on this. Let's take a look at a short cliff note version of what this is. So let's take a closer look at that law that was called the Black Code Law. So if you already lived in Illinois and were black, you were okay and already a resident. But no more people of the black community can come in to actually live here. They can come in and stay for a 10 day pass and then leave or receive a fine. Again, books are written on the Black Code Law when it was voted in during that time period. But let's go forward a little bit of what happened next. So. In 1861, that started the Civil War. All this other stuff happened before the Civil War even started. So four years later is how long it lasted. And in four years, Illinois is the first state to ratify the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. Also in 1865, they repealed the Black Code Law. And that also was the end of the Civil War. But my question always has been, what happened after the war? That time period from 1865 to 1908. You only see blurbs that says things in Springfield were prospering and things were doing well. And you hear things like that. People got used to the war being over and uh, slavery was abolished. But what happened? Because later, way later in 1908, Springfield had a population of about 30,000 people when 10,000 of the white residents started a riot. And the riot started over the arrest and detainment of two black men about one month apart. And it ended with 11 dead and much of the town destroyed. Many historians believe the riot may have not even happened if only the first incident that happened worked its course through the legal system and a sentence was given. But there was a lady named Mabel Hallam. She was the wife of a well-respected conductor. We're gonna talk about her. Mabel, well, she was caught cheating with her lover and she falsely stated that she had been raped by a black man named George Richardson. The police picked him up and threw him in jail. But the State Journal Register, or the paper back then, wrote just crazy stuff in the paper that would purposely incite a crowd. And the, when they read it that very same day, crowds formed at the jail, and it's pictured right there behind those tents there, and they were calling to actually lynch the two inmates that were there. Now, the sheriff at the time was named Charles Werner, and he knew he could disperse this crowd, but it wasn't going away anytime soon. So he did. He got out and he was able to disperse the crowd, but they were still there. They just went away from the jail area. He called a business friend of his that we're going to talk about named Loper, who owned a car, which was rare back then. And he asked him to pull the car around to the backside of the jail. And he was going to put these two inmates in that car. And he asked his friend to drive all the way to Bloomington, Illinois, where they, they will be safe. Now, the story of these two inmates was that a guy named Clergy Ballard, he woke up in the middle of the night and found a man standing over his daughter's bed. He chased the guy out of his house to his front lawn, and they got in a fight. And he lost the fight when the guy stabbed this Ballard, and he was mortally wounded. And uh, when the guy ran off, the neighbors came over, and before he died, he named this guy named Joe James as his assailant. Now the neighbors with some friends went and found Joe James and they beat him and they kept beating him until the police arrived. 
They arrested Joe James and brought him to jail where he stayed incarcerated. Later that mo in the month, uh, George Richardson was also arrested when the newspaper reported falsely that he had raped Mabel Hallam because that's what she said falsely. Then there was Kate Howard. Yes, a house room operator that was publicly known not to like the black community. What she does is fire up the crowd and tell them that a local business owner named Harry Loper helped the sheriff get the two guys out of town without them seeing in his automobile. And guess what that crowd did? They turned around and went right back into town and they destroyed that guy's automobile. And you know what? They also destroyed his business, the restaurant that he owned destroyed it all. Here's another picture of Harry Loper's destroyed restaurant and car. And then on 9th and Madison, the military was called in and there they are securing at least one of the corners from a house in an area that's already been burned down by the crowd. This crowd went all over town. You can see from these photos just burning down anything that, of, that was either the black community or anyone that was helping the two guys that were in jail. Just to give you an idea, where it all started. It started right here at the county jail on 7th and Jefferson at the time where the two guys were uh, told that, hey, they're not here anymore or dispersed actually is what the sheriff said. So the crowd went a little bit south where they found out how they weren't there anymore and that a local business owner got them out and sent them to Bloomington in his car. So the crowd went over here a couple of blocks to 5th Street and down south to this area. Why this area? That's where Loper's car and business was located. And they trashed it and they burned it and you saw the pictures, his car and his business was no longer. So after that, the crowd's attitude changed. It changed from being, we have to be mad at anyone who helped these two guys that were in prison to escape or anything about that to let's get all people of color out of Springfield. At this point, somebody said something that changed the motivation of the crowd. So they, they U-turned and went back north and the red lines show you all the streets they went on. 10,000 people, mind you. They went up and north and there's a couple of places that they hit. Along the way, during three blocks, 24 businesses, it did not matter who owned them. White, black, they burned them. Everything went down. They were just out of control at this point. So after going through those three blocks, they made their way up north to a barber shop owned by Scott Burton. Scott Burton was a black man, but married to a white woman. So even mixed marriages were happening way back in that day. But this particular type of crowd didn't look too favorably on uh, mixed marriages. So they told him, we're going to burn your barber shop down. And he said, no, just move along. He brought out a shotgun, pointed it at the crowd and said, move along. And they didn't quite move along. And then he fired a shot supposedly above their head. Somehow he pulled the trigger and the shotgun went off. Out of those thousands of people, a lot of them had guns and they all returned fire. Thousands of people against one shotgun. Scott Burton did not survive the retaliation of bullets that came his way. He died at his barber shop and unfortunately they burned it down anyways. This uh, next part is both sad and sickening. Um, it happened. It's part of history. It's very difficult to bring about. But this crowd... Uh, didn't stop at the death of Scott Burton and his barbershop. After they had killed him there, they took this guy a couple blocks north and a couple blocks to the east, all the way to 12th and Madison. And they were going to hang his lifeless body somewhere from a tree. And they accomplished that. But upon accomplishing that and doing more, by the way, uh, the military showed up. And the military was not going to take any guff from this crowd to the point that they formed ranks, loaded their weapons, and fired into the legs of the crowd, taking down the whole front half of the crowd because their legs went out from underneath them. Many people got shot. And then they stood up, fixed bayonets, and were ordered to march into that crowd. To these soldiers, it was war, and these people were the enemy. And this crowd was going to get dispersed, go back home, or they were going to die right there with Scott Burton at 12th and Madison. And once the people saw the soldiers come in, then they started dispersing because the bayonets were fixed and they started using them on the crowd. This was a no joke situation to that, to those military soldiers and the people saw it and they dispersed. And that was the end of how the 
race riots ended, but that military stuck around and they were in a police state here in Springfield for a while till they were sure everything was going to chill back down. Like a, a lot of people got arrested. 80 people got arrested for being the insiders of this riot. And you can read books about this and I'll put links in the history. But we, we, we cannot forget this or we'll be doomed to repeat it. And we will not repeat it because Springfield made some commemorative places so people know it was there. Let's take a look at those. So this is Springfield in present day. Uh, there are commemorative plaques. There are outdoors and indoors, and these particular sculptures are there as well. It's to remind everybody about the 1908 race riots and how anything like that should never happen again. These are evil times, evil people somehow motivated a crowd, and 10,000 is a lot of people, even in t by today's standard, and to do some evil things, and it can never happen again. And there's some sculptures out there to remind people of what happened back then and to know that in the present day, it can't happen now. And hopefully, with Springfield having this history, not only can we be the place that had the evil, terrible history of 1908 race riots, maybe, just maybe, I have this glimpse that we can be the place that can figure out how to get along and live together peacefully and then we can spread that from Springfield to the rest of the United States. I know, it's a pipe dream. But we came from that to where we're at now. I'm sure we can move forward even further. As a book by Carol Merritt once stated that this may have been a race riot, but it's a race riot in which people of Caucasian died more than the race they were fighting. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but I would suggest reading her book and several others that I'll link to in the description. And now I'm going to move forward into the purpose of this and where this comes from and how this developed into my attitude towards Springfield in the present day.